public. All right. Welcome today. I'm glad everyone uh, came. Um, my first slide here, of course, says warning may contain chemistry. I am a professor of chemistry. Um, everything I talk about contains chemistry, at least in uh, some, some respect. So a um, little bit about uh, me while we're waiting for everybody else to uh, show up. Um, I'm uh, based in Edwardsville, Illinois, uh, so that's in the southern part of Illinois in the United States. I'm very close to St. Louis. It's about a 20-minute drive uh, to downtown St. Louis. We're on the eastern side of the Mississippi River. So, um, you know, I started off, um, I'm originally Canadian, so I'm from a little uh, town close to Montreal in uh, Quebec, and I uh, went to, um, got a Bachelor of uh, Science in Chemistry from a place called Mount Allison University. That's right at the tip of the Bay of Fundy, uh, claim to fame. Um, there are 10 meter vertical tides there. Um, it's, it's quite impressive to see the tide come in. You actually have to run to keep ahead of it. Um, from there, uh, let's see, that was 1988. It's a long time ago. Uh, from there, I went to University of British Columbia, got a PhD in inorganic chemistry. Um, University of British Columbia is in Vancouver, so that's on the Pacific coast. Uh, five years there brings us to 1993. And um, I spent five years as a postdoc and lecturer at the University of Vermont. And in 1998, I started at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. So um, that brings us almost to today. Um, basically, I've had my career at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. I'm a, a professor there. I've been the chair of the department. I'm no longer the chair of the department. Um, that is a sheer delight. So. Enough with the introductions. Let's let's continue. Let's see if I can run the um, projector. Um, having the little red dot doesn't seem to make my cat move, but it's not designed to do that, so that's okay. One next. All right. So there's the title slide. Uh, consequences of electron transfer. I've been thinking about this title a lot. This um, this is a big title. Um, it's either big or little. I could just say, consequences of electron transfer, we are alive. Thank you very much. Bye. But that would be a fairly disappointing uh, talk. The consequences of electron transfer do include a huge amount of biochemistry, do include a huge amount of industrial chemistry. Um, since electrons are the glue that hold atoms together as molecules, changing the number of electrons has an effect on the bonding of molecules. Sometimes it's a subtle effect, but other times there's dramatic changes in molecular structure. So the strategies that are used to manage electron transfer, um, in, especially in biochemical systems, um, to achieve dramatic structural consequences are in themselves clever, interesting, and important. All right, bear with me while I change slides. This is my first talk in Second Life. So why should we care about electron transfer reactions? Well, the biological relevance, it's nice to be alive. Um, there are economic issues, quality of life issues, um, for example, energy production and storage. I'm not going to talk about uh, much of that, um, but aluminum manufacture is done um, electrochemically. Nylon historically has been made electrochemically. The chloralkali um, process, um, which makes chlorine and uh, sodium hydroxide and bleach and things like that. Uh, Miniata Bay, I think, is a um, problem area that used to be done with mercury. Um, you know, all of those are important industrial uses of electrochemistry. But can we have it all in one example? So, in my Facebook feed, at one point, I came across a a uh, nice bit of recent work with um, nitrogenase. So nitrogenase is what bacteria use in the soil to fix nitrogen. Nitrogen N2. Nothing wrong with nitrogen N2. It really needs fixing. I've never understood that. But 
to turn it into ammonia, to turn it into biochemically available nitrogen, there's some beautiful molecules that have evolved to uh, make those transformation happen. We cannot compete with how elegant those molecules um, function just yet. We have the Haber-Bosch process. So Haber-Bosch is an industrial process, takes H2 and N2, um, and it uses an iron catalyst at 500 degrees Celsius and 200 atmospheres, and it forms ammonia. I summarize there, I say lots of fossil fuels to heat iron. I actually have a, a statistic here. Uh, let's see if I can cut and paste that into the comments. So it's about 1% uh, of global energy use goes into the Haber-Bosch process to make ammonia. That's a lot, um, and that means that there is a huge amount of uh, fossil fuels being burnt to keep the iron at the 500 degrees Celsius. And in fact, the H2 comes from the water gas shift reaction, which is uh, basically natural gas being burnt um, to carbon monoxide. Um, that helps the temperature, and then the carbon monoxides react with the water to give you CO2 and H2. So between those two processes, um, that is a very energy intensive industry. And uh, it's the basis for the nitrogen that we use in fertilizers. Ammonia, um, about 30% of the food that is produced in the world requires um, the use of ammonia fertilizers. Without this uh, Haber-Bosch process, there would be much fewer people that uh, could be uh, fed. So where are we now? How does, how does nature do this? Well, here's, a, uh, here's, here's an example. This is a um, molecule of an iron uh, molybdenum nitrogenase from A. Vinlandi. Uh, I'm gonna use this as an example. This particular view, and I've shown you a few views uh, scattered around the auditorium of um, some molecules I have in my talk. Uh, this particular view, you see there's two um, um, molecules of it shown. Uh, one can actually, if you look at it, cross your eyes and um, look at the one in the middle and uh, you get a 3D view of it. So this is a, um, a view that a, a J-mole, which is a um, Java-based viewer, freely distributable, um, allows us to have. The data itself comes from um, the where does the data itself come from? It comes from the rsb.org uh, uh, database. We'll see. Whoops, I didn't hit enter on that one. We'll be enter on that one. So in my talk here, I'm using um, public domain data uh, to show you some of these molecules. Let's see. Backslash one n. So what do we have to know in order to understand how this is working? Well, we have to split a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. We have to split hydrogen-hydrogen bonds, um, at least for the Haber-Bosch process. We have to reconnect nitrogen and hydrogens. Oops. Okay, that worked. So how do we do that? How do we understand how we activate small molecules? And you can't get much smaller as a molecule than two atoms. Um, have to worry about molecular orbital diagrams. So I put together some molecular orbital diagrams. There's one floating in the sky above us as we um, sit here. Um, ordinarily, that would be a sign of the apocalypse, but I think um, I think in Second Life we can. Um, we can uh, cope with it. Um, and, you know, basically there's some, um, I'm not going to go into incredible amounts of detail on the MO diagrams, because uh, because that would be unfriendly. But there are things that we have to know about electrons in order to be able to understand how um, 
they how transfer of them affects bonding. So electrons are simultaneously particles and waves, just like photons are. Um, and so they have wave properties. And these properties, especially phase, uh, govern how uh, bonding happens. So for example, we have things called orbitals. Each atom has orbitals. I'm, uh, sure, some of you are aware of um, atomic orbital theories. Um, for a hydrogen atom, an electron gets stashed in a 1s orbital. The 1 basically tells you what shell it's in. It's a 1 would be the closest shell to uh, the nucleus. The s tells you something about the shape of the orbital. Uh, it doesn't stand for spherical, but uh, it's a good mnemonic. Um, the orbitals have three-dimensional shapes and they have phase and that governs where the electrons uh, can exist. And there's a recurring shape are called S, that one's a spherical, P looks like a dumbbell, D tends to look like four-leaf clovers, although there's one that looks like a dumbbell that's got a donut around the middle, and F, F, and yeah, they kind of look crazy and we don't need to talk about them right now. The idea of um, atomic orbitals are very important because we can build molecular orbitals by taking linear combinations of atomic orbitals. And that's basically that's basically what I've done up above us. So um, up above us, I've got um, the orbitals for something like something like um, an oxygen molecule, O2. That's easier to explain than and to uh, write from the beginning. One N. But let's start with hydrogen. So I, I didn't res this one. Um, on the outer side, so here and here, um, those represent two hydrogen atoms that are coming closer and closer and closer together. And their atomic orbitals, which are basically little spheres, um, can interfere with each other. Because these orbitals are waves. And as we know, waves can interfere with each other. When you put two waves close together, they can interfere with each other in a constructive manner. So they add together, and that's what this lower um, orbital looks like. It's lower in energy. Uh, Y-axis on this gra on this picture is supposed to be energy. Uh, it's lower in energy because, well, if you have a nucleus and another nucleus, they're going to repel each other. But there's plenty of space in between where electrons are allowed to be, and that will give you a plus minus plus configuration that'll draw the whole system together. Okay, so the bottom one is from constructive interference. If you have constructive interference, you can also have destructive interference. When you have the two atomic orbitals and they have opposite phases, then you'll end up with a space in the middle where electrons cannot exist. That means the nuclei see each other, and even on the sides, if there are electrons in that orbital, on the sides of these big old lobes, those electrons uh, would be repelling each other. This guy is called an anti-bonding orbital, and I've given the, um, given the actual name of it a sigma star. A little star means it's anti-bonding, and it comes from the 1s. So for hydrogen, H2, um, you've only got two electrons, and they both live down here in the bonding orbital. The anti-bonding orbital is empty, and the H2 molecule is as stable as it can be. So thing to remember, these things on either side, the atomic orbitals, they're just there as reference points. Uh, once the molecule forms, the um, atomic orbitals don't exist anymore. These molecular orbitals, though, can interact with orbitals on metals to do some pretty interesting things. Um, where's my next slide? So for example, um, oxidative addition, it's a classic reaction we've known about for decades where a hydrogen can react with a metal. I'm thinking of a transition metal, like chromium or ruthenium or some other delicious metal. And the wonderful thing is that 
the molecule of hydrogen attaches to the metal side on in some fashion and then the bond between the hydrogens um, ruptures and the two hydrogens are directly attached to the metal's hydrides. So this process is called oxidative addition. It's a nice way of activating a small molecule. So in the Haber-Bosch process, the iron is going to split the hydrogens it's going to split the nitrogens, and then it's going to allow them to recombine as ammonia. Um, now, one of the things about oxidative addition that I just showed you is it's reversible. So if you have two atoms attached to a metal like iron, they can reconnect to each other. They have to worry about the overall redistribution of electrons in uh, this process. Let's see. No, no, no. And we have to think about how the molecular orbitals can be visualized to make these changes happen. Okay. So the changes in bonding are going to change the molecular uh, properties. Um, bond strengths can change bond vibration frequencies, and that can influence reaction rates. Um, binding to a metal, the sideways binding to a metal can change the reactivity of whatever binds sideways. It's called umpalung. Um, things with carbon-carbon double bonds, when they bind sideways to metal, become subject to reaction with electron-rich species. Uh, without the metal there, they don't react with electron-rich species because they themselves are electron-rich, and the electrons repel each other. So, um, you know, this this idea that uh, bonding influences how the electrons are distributed and how reactivity happens is very important. Okay. Uh, let's see. The antibonding configuration is still considered a molecule? Yes, because the... Uh, energy levels um, within the molecule exist um, are, are hmm. the energy levels potentially exist I have to be careful how I say that um, and if an extra electron comes in that's where they get stashed um, so the molecule if you go from O2 to O2 minus um, you would just stash an electron in the next available um, orbital we can get information from vibrational frequencies. Let's see. I think I've skipped ahead in my talk a little bit. Let me go back to backslash one ten. Okay. Okay, yeah. So basically, basically, when we look at when we look at molecules, and we look at how the um, vibrational frequencies are affected by bonding, I'm going to show you a little bit of my own work, and then move back to nitrogenase. Um, what we can find is that the strength of the bonds are influenced by how these orbitals are occupied, how much bonding happens, how much anti-bonding happens, and that's going to determine how strong a uh, spring, if you consider a molecule to be um, connected to each other by little springs, um, the uh, vibrational uh, frequency is going to be dependent on the strength of the spring. So I've got my little happy um, vibration thing happening. If we make the spring looser uh, by occupying more antibonding orbitals, the vibration is going to slow down. If we make the vibration tighter by proportionately occupying more bonding orbitals, the vibration is going to uh, speed up. And we've got plenty of we've got plenty of tools infrared spectroscopy, for example, right here, um, to be able to 
uh, look at how electron transfer can influence vibrational rates. So, so here's some data from my own group. Um, uh, Brian Schutte was one of my graduate students. He uh, graduated in uh, 2011. This is from his thesis. We made a molecule that uh, kind of looks um, a bit strange here. The part that I'm showing you right now has a ruthenium double bonded to carbon, double bonded to carbon again, right over here. And what we can do is take an electron away from it. The electron actually comes from that iron atom. So we go from a ferrocene to a ferrocenial group. And that change in charge actually changes the rate at which that ruthenium double bond carbon, double bond carbon vibrates. Um, this is an infrared um, spectroelectrochemistry uh, set of data and what we find is that in one form uh, I think where the this iron is neutral what we find is that we have a vibration up here for th that um, ruthenium double bond carbon double bond carbon unit and then when we oxidize we find um, the vibration moves over here and it's a beautifully reversible process Let's see, bank slash one, N. Um, we also do iron porphyrins um, and ruthenium porphyrins. Uh, porphyrin is a molecule that you've got in you. Uh, the uh, porphyrin unit is basically these four um, uh, five-membered rings that contain nitrogen linked by a single carbon atom and then there's some organic shrubbery on the outside. Um, this particular arrangement of organic shrubbery makes the molecule into a heme which lurks in your hemoglobin and myoglobin and allows um, uh, those proteins to transport oxygen from your lungs into your uh, muscles. I prefer to just kind of think of the um, porphyrin as a little ring into which a um, metal can sit. And metals tend to like to have six things attached. So it'll grab on with its tiny little hands um, to something at the top and something at the bottom. The particular molecules we like, I don't know if you can see that, there's an NO at the top and then at the bottom we have some other and we're going to call it a ligand. Okay, so um, in um, one case here, this is cyclic voltammetry data. I won't go into that. Basically, is a way of studying electron transfers. In this particular case, we see um, five electron transfer events for this molecule. Um, this in the middle is a photograph of the apparatus we use to collect the data and over here we actually see how the vibrational spectrum changes. So uh, vibrations are basically probed by mid-infrared light. Uh, the If you zoomed in you might see the axis there. That axis is called wave numbers. It's basically how many um, how many waves can fit in one centimeter. What I've got in this upper corner, I happen to be sitting on a molecule. Um, that's actually a ruthenium porphyrin um, nitric oxide. Uh, what is the bottom ligand? Yeah, underneath the seat there is a um, um, tetrachlorophenoxide. That was a molecule. I'm sitting on a van der Waals surface of um, this molecule. Um, it's a molecule whose x-ray crystal structure was done by Doug Powell at the University of Oklahoma and the molecule was synthesized by um, Dr. Dennis Awazabiza uh, who recently graduated at the University of Oklahoma. Let's see. Um, next. Okay, so back to the Haber process because the, nitro the, nitrogenase, the nitrogenase reaction is a beautiful thing. At room temperature or thereabouts, bacteria can convert dinitrogen, N2, into ammonia. Um, Haber process requires 500 degrees Celsius and most soil is not at 500 degrees Celsius unless you're on Venus. Um, so 
I uh, came across this paper about um, oh, about three weeks ago. It was in my Facebook feed. Uh, this is a beautiful example where we've been able to take a enzyme and make it work photochemically through some nanochemistry. So by biochem methods, we take nitrogen, there's protons, there's electrons. The energy source is ATP. I got a slide of that next. Um, that's adenosyl triphosphate. Maybe it's not. Um, I have to confess, I'm an inorganic chemist, so the names of biochemicals um, evade me sometimes. But N2, H plus, electrons, the energy source is ATP. Nitrogenase, either the iron only version or the iron molybdenum version, uh, converts it into ammonia, H2. And the ADP plus an extra phosphate can be recycled. The King Group um, has basically been able to take um, nitrogenase, attach them, them to cadmium sulfide nanoparticles, and use light as the energy source to affect the same transformation. Uh, it's not a, it's not industrially, um, uh, not capable to be used industrially just yet, but this is a very nice, very nice development. So how does this work? Okay, so in biochemistry, who does the heavy lifting? Um, took 16 of these transformations of the adenosyl, um, that's a little bit of a sugar. Here's the triphosphate, one, two, three phosphates. <laughs> and then um, the energy from this reaction comes from the cleavage of one of those uh, bonds to make uh, the diphosphate. Uh, that's how biochemistry does the heavy lifting. How we can do the heavy lifting with nanoparticles is we can, we can uh, use photochemistry. So yes, I drew this. Uh, this is another example of um, why I shouldn't give up my day job. Um, we can push an electron up into an excited state. That's why we got Sisyphus. He's pushing up the um, electron into the excited state. I guess he wants to do something nefarious to his friend here. Um, electrons that are in excited states can be used to make useful transformations go. So, but if we talk about photons moving electrons into excited states, it gets us into semi uh, into uh, solar power a bit. I made up a whole bunch of slides on uh, solar power, but decided not to use them because um, you know about an hour long talk is appropriate. You don't want me going on and on and on forever. Um, semiconductors. I'm going to explain a little bit about those, and we have a gratuitous cat sketch. All righty. So we've got um, molecular orbitals above us. Um, I didn't do the ones for a tetrahedral system. It follows a slightly different uh, set of rules. When you've got two atoms, it's kind of easy to see how things get together. When you've got four, it's a little harder. Usually what we do is we take um, the atomic orbitals. If you've got a central one, we just use the regular atomic orbitals. If you've got a central atom surrounded by other atoms, we tend to take those other atoms and combine them um, before we allow them to combine with the central atom. So our H4 tetrahedral unit, for, for example, methane, would have one lone orbital and then three other orbitals. It would combine nicely with the one lone orbital, the 2s orbital, and then uh, the p orbitals on the carbon to give an orbital down, and three orbitals down. These guys up are, um, bond, are anti-bonding. You stash electrons in, you get two electrons per orbital. That's our eight electrons for a, um, um, for a methane uh, molecule. I only really show methane um, to get us into tetrahedral uh, geometries. Silane 
has the same structure, but um, if you compare um, two at, uh, the second row and the third row of the periodic table, the energy differences for silicon are lower than the energy differences for carbon. These orbitals end up being closer. Why am I showing you this? Um, that probably is a good question to ask. It's, it's not because I'm being passive aggressive or anything. I'm really um, trying to get us to solid state structures. So remember that diamond has the same structure as silicon and um, in diamond all the carbons are connected um, uh, tetrahedrally to each other. So each carbon can be thought of as being at the center of a tetrahedron. Same structure as in uh, silicon, in fact. Um, and the more orbitals that you have to invoke as your molecules get bigger and bigger and bigger, the more, um, well, the more orbitals you get. I mean, every atomic orbital that you put in turns into a molecular orbital. So what I've tried to draw here is what happens to the filled orbitals. They tend to um, create one band of orbitals so closely packed together that you can't really, um, can't really distinguish them. They're so their uh, energy differences are so small, it's very easy for electrons to shift thermally from one to another. The empty orbitals up here for diamond turn into an empty band. This means diamond is what we call a semiconductor because um, you could, with the right energy, photon of the right energy perhaps, promote an electron from this um, sardine can of a band where the electrons can't move into that empty band where the electrons are mobile and can go anywhere in the solid. Uh, this doesn't happen um, too well for diamonds because this gap is really, really big. But for silicon, the gap is smaller. So promotion of electrons from down in the, um, it's called valence band, up into the conduction band allows uh, the electrons to move about the solid. Um, I suppose I should mention doping. Um, it's possible to have the odd phosphorus atom in uh, silicon, and that would um, essentially give you a tiny little band in the gap that has electrons in, and essentially the new gap would be uh, smaller, so it uh, would be a more conductive um, species. Same thing goes for um, oh, aluminum. You could um, put aluminum into silicon and have uh, close this gap and make it more conductive. So this is N-doping and P-doping. And fortunately, silicon does not compete in the Olympics, so doping is not a problem. So back to our bio-inspired reactions, we got cadmium sulfide nanoparticles. And I was talking about silicon. Um, Cadmium sulfide nanoparticles uh, serve as a semiconductor in this case. Backslash one. And I'm having a cat technical issue. There we go. Um, so I originally drew this picture thinking about uh, dye sensitized solar cells. We actually do an experiment um, inspired by the uh, University of Wisconsin's MRSEC website. Let's see if I can find that website and post it here. Okay, it'll come up. It'll come up later in the talk. Um, and essentially, we use titanium dioxide with anthocyanins from raspberry juice. And the pun here is that anthocyanins are cations. <laughs> okay. My jokes serve the purpose of contrast to good humor. So essentially what we can think of in terms of what King has been doing is um, the cadmium sulfide nanoparticle has a filled band and an empty band. Um, there's some sort of electron reservoir that could be potentially an electrode or it could just be some chemical source. And what can happen is that light can promote 
an electron from this lower energy level to the upper energy level. Well, if that happens, there's two, thing, two consequences. The electron could just simply go back to the lower energy level, releasing the energy it absorbed as heat. That's not what we want to do. The electron could get trapped by the nitrogenase that's attached to the um, cadmium sulfide uh, nanoparticle. And this little cat is supposed to represent the cadmium sulf or the um, nitrogenase molecule. All right. So to do the cat justice, um, here's actually um, a couple of slides of some nitrogenase. This is an iron-only uh, protein. Uh, it's um, not the one that King is using right now. Right in the middle, you can see this kind of tetrahedrally looking thing, which is a Fe8S7. So it's basically um, two tetrahedra of irons interpenetrated with two tetrahedra of sulfurs. And uh, one of the vertices of the sulfur tetrahedra is shared between the two units. So this is the actual uh, protein that they were uh, using in King's work. Uh, note that it does not actually resemble a cat, which is a shame. Um, this is, nitrogenases are giant proteins. Um, I tend to be an inorganic chemist, inorganic chemist and electrochemist. I don't really do the biochemistry. Um, all of this organic shrubbery serves very important purposes. Uh, it regulates the flow of um, protons in and out of the active site. It regulates the flow of dinitrogen in and out of the active site. And it regulates the flow of usually ATP into the storage areas, which are tend to be the um, Fe, 8S7 uh, units uh, for um, the storage areas for electrons. All righty. Okay. okay. I need to see my keyboard. There we go. So um, back to my much more primitive uh, slide. We have uh, light coming in. Um, if this were a solar cell, the gray area could be a transparent electrode, um, but it doesn't have to be. Um, a, a, a photon, this purple squiggly line has come in and it's um, promoted an electron from the valence band up into the conduction band. That electron is now free to move within this nanoparticle. Um, and of course, little little electrons moving uh, tend to excite the uh, cat. And you know, as I filled in its eyes, it, it is looking, it is looking kind of irked. Backslash one. So um, here's a close-up view of the Fe8S7 cofactor in uh, nitrogenase, uh, 3D view. I think I've got this in um, one of the uh, pillars behind us. Um, the ones I materialized behind us, uh, you can copy those. I think I set those to um, be uh, freely copied. Uh, and this is public domain data. There are note cards in all of the um, 3D views that I've resed uh, behind um, behind the stage um, that explain where the data is from and uh, which paper it's from as well. So as you can see in this particular structure, this would be where the electrons uh, from the um, ATP type processes would normally hang out before the main cofactor, the iron molybdenum cofactor, would do its job on nitrogen. So um, you know, basically, we have interpenetrating um, tetrahedra sulfurs with um, um, iron uh, tetrahedra on these. Cubanes, these are cubanes. Distorted cubanes. So essentially what happens um, when we have when we have the electron in the conduction band, it's mobile in the um, uh, cadmium sulfide 
um, nanoparticle and it can be trapped by this now happy looking uh, nitrogenase uh, molecule and that happens a few times because it takes a number of electrons to break that nitrogen nitrogen uh, triple bond what has to happen to recharge this cadmium sulfide nanoparticle? In King's paper, they use uh, chemical sources, but again, um, there's no reason why this could not be attached to an electrode to make, um, to make this into a photocell. Um, all right, so where are we now? At some point, um, the since this enzyme is a catalyst, <laughs> um, yeah, I know, um, it has to recharge. So essentially what happens is that um, the starting materials come in, N2, H2O, etc., cetera, and um, they interact with um, the cadmium sulfide bound nitrogenase and allow ammonia to, to escape. Up to escape, and that's a little electrode in uh, that was Albert. Yay! Um, so I thought this was I thought this was beautiful work. It was in Science um, that um, um, that kind of shows shows that it, it should be of general interest. Here is uh, where the action happens in nitrogenase. It's a molybdenum iron uh, cofactor, and the molybdenum atom is this green thing sitting on uh, top, and it caps um, an iron seven trigonal prism. So um, you can see one of the faces of the prism, and by prism I mean a shape exactly like what you'd associate with Isaac Newton splitting using a glass thingy to split white light into um, uh, different colors. So um, this would be one face of the uh, prism uh, facing us, and then there's another two atoms of iron behind. A last atom of iron caps the uh, prism kind of opposite to what the molybdenum is doing. And this particular paper was uh, fun, the one that uh, where the structure was published, because uh, they showed a carbon atom sitting inside the prism. So most of the time you think carbon should have four things attached to it. Well, this carbon is equally close to all six of those irons. So it is a six coordinate um, trigonal prismatic uh, carbon atom, which is, yeah, that's noteworthy. Um, that's especially in a biochemical structure. So that uh, carbon atom, uh, we would call it organometallic, and it's sitting in a pretty alien environment. Now, I think there is some question as to whether that's a carbon or a nitrogen at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, either way, that's an unusual environment coordination environment for a second row element like either um, carbon or nitrogen. Up here the molybdenum is um, blocked by um, blocked by um, uh, donor atoms from uh, the protein but these can move out of the way to allow nitrogen to interact with that molybdenum atom. All right where are we now? So how does this happen? How does the um, nitrogen nitrogen um, triple bond get broken? Well, that is an active area of study, and we use both model compounds um, that um, are have structures close to that found in the enzyme and the actual enzymes to figure this out. Uh, so I've um, put a few abstracts in from um, papers from. Um, American Chemical Society journals. This one's from Inorganic Chemistry. Um, let's see. I can. There we go. From Table of Contents, that's public domain issue. Um, information so there's um, there's where um, we can find uh, those those sorts of things in this particular structure what we can see is that we've got a whole bunch of irons 
and those two dark blue atoms are the nitrogen and the, they are bound Am I getting the right one? The nitrogen in this molecule is bound uh, sideways. So it does seem to take multiple metal atoms to pull apart two nitrogen atoms in nitrogenase. And so um, we have in that last paper some structures that were very similar to the enzymes in that they were interpenetrating um, tetrahedra of iron atoms. Here is one, it's got a cobalt atom, it's got um, discrete charges, um, the, I, the nitrogens are bound um, uh, to the cobalt in a linear manner. Uh, so basically, um, basically this would be a very different environment from the enzyme. Um, there's a lot of work being done with early transition metals like the ones that are to the left of the column where chromium is um, and late transition metals which are to the right of uh, chromium in an effort to come up with artificial fixing of um, ammonia or of uh, nitrogen to make ammonia. Yay! Slash one N. So we can use electricity to cause uh, chemical changes, as, as I kind of outlined with the photochemical cell um, that uh, King was uh, using. If we could just attach nitrogenase to an electrode, we could adjust the potentials so uh, the reaction would work. Um, if we could make the nitrogenase stable enough. Uh, it's nice to activate small molecules like N2. There's plenty of nitrogen around. If we do it at uh, room temperature, uh, we could stop using about 1% of the fossil fuels that um, are contributing to uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the air. So studying model compounds to um, make uh, to, to, to facilitate um, nitrogen uh, fixing for this example um, will is, is a very nice thing to do because uh, nitrogenases are uh, just very fragile. All right, so how? Chemical and electrochemical means. Um, there has been um, some nice progress in uh, the area. We don't have a artificial enzyme yet to take N2 and turn it into ammonia. But each of the steps where nitrogen gets reduced, and by reduction I mean it gains an electron, and then it gains another proton, essentially the two steps, uh, reduction and protonation, uh, end up just transferring a whole hydrogen atom, each of the steps necessary has been um, documented in model processes. We just haven't put them all together yet. All righty. So, story so far, uh, we've got small molecule activation through electron transfer, which is going to tie to a lot of fundamental science, uh, biochemistry, bioinorganic and inorganic chemistry. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of study that's gone on um, on nitrogenase alone, and it's just one example of a small molecule. Right? Other small molecules include, um, of course, taking nit nitrogen and using it to uh, making uh, make uh, ammonia for fertilizers and other nitrogen-containing organics carbon dioxide plus water, making artificial photosynthesis to make fuels, um, taking water itself and splitting it into H2 and O2, again, for fuel use. Uh, a lot of these can um, be potentially driven by solar energy uh, and reactions of NOx, which is the area that I'm uh, particularly interested in studying right now. Alrighty, so we're kind of drawing closer to the end of my prepared stuff. Um, and I just wanted to uh, plug a few things. Um, some resources, JMOL is 
the molecule viewing program that um, I used. Here's uh, the links. Uh, basically, it's Java and um, with um, JMOL, you can view the molecular structures, um, thousands of them that are available at data repositories. Uh, the crystallography open database is one of my favorites. It's got a lot of smaller molecules. Uh, the research collaboratory for structural bioinformatics, um, the um, RCSB, um, link that, that I've just posted uh, that has a lot of protein data and it allows you to zoom in on particular areas of interest. Um, I use Blender to, um, to um, um, upload res the um, uh, molecule I happen to be sitting on right now. Okay, and just a few um, just a few other um, quick pictures. Here's a nice view of a model complex, not the actual uh, nitrogenase site of um, the iron only nitrogenase. It's it's weird. Nitrogenase uh, comes in two flavors. Um, both of the both of them contain iron, but not all of them contain molybdenum, and both are able to take iron, uh, nitrogen and uh, make ammonia out of it. So the role of the molybdenum atom is not always, um, not always as clear cut as you might think. All right, and uh, this is the same molecule, uh, um, 3D uh, version of it. I think I've posted this one uh, behind, uh, behind this. And um, acknowledgments, um, students, as always, since 1998, I've had upwards of, oh, I think I've had at least uh, 20 master's students since 1998 and about 40, 45 undergraduate students. We're actually going for um, dim sum tomorrow as a, um, a group event. Um, my collaborator, George Richter at the University of um, Oklahoma, um, I visited there earlier in the week. Uh, we only had one tornado um, alarm. We only had to huddle in the basement once. Um, that, was, that was fun. Um, George and I went to grad school together, so um, that's, it's always a pleasure going down there to visit. Uh, again, Department of Chemistry at SIU has been very supportive. Um, the College of Arts and Sciences there and the graduate school. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge NSF's um, support. Um, um, we're currently funded to look at the porphyrin nitric oxide uh, compounds. So, and and is that my last slide? Oh, I think it is. Okay. I think it is. I had forgotten. I had made something like a hundred slides and then chose the ones. So at this point, I'm uh, um, happy to answer questions. I haven't been able to keep an eye on the chat as much as I uh, thought I would during this. Part of that was cat related. Um, but if anyone's got questions, I'll be happy to answer to the best of my ability. Yes, I was. I, I'm, I'm quite happy to have these uh, molecular orbital diagrams now, because uh, I will be using them. I um, did some uh, machinima for my advanced inorganic chemistry class on crystal field theory um, in the fall, and it worked out very well. Question: uh, What property of carbon caused it to be the basis of life rather than silicon? That is an excellent. Excellent, excellent question. Um, carbon is very abundant, so it is, um, you know, a logical choice for um, for for living things to be based on. But there's there's some um, very interesting things 
differences between carbon and silicon. Carbon, um, because of how the atomic orbitals are structured, um, does not mind making multiple bonds. So carbon is going to make uh, single bonds, of course. It's going to make very stable double bonds and very stable triple bonds. Um, and all of these um, types of bonding allow for different um, organic chemistry to happen, much richer organic chemistry to happen. For silicon, it ends up that the um, atomic orbitals on silicon that are available for bonding have internal nodes, which means that if you get two silicons too close together, they start to have anti-bonding happening. So silicon-silicon double bonds and silicon-silicon triple bonds are very difficult to engineer. There are examples. Uh, it was an active area of research um, a couple of decades ago to find the very first silicon-silicon double bond. Um, the multiple bonding that we find in uh, carbon allows us to have um, ring structures that have delocalized electrons, like the porphyrins, couldn't build the same structure out of uh, silicon. Now, there may be life that's based on silicon outside of our solar system, but I tend to think it would probably be more like a semiconductor type of life. So I hope I hope that answered the question, but didn't didn't scare you. Viger, yes, yes, um, yeah. Silicon life would be would be very very interesting. It 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 wouldn't it can't be a one for one. Um, substitution of uh, silicon for carbon into um, like the life we have here. It would have to be radically different. All right. Oh, sorry, Starflower. I will be posting or I will be working with, um, with um, Jess and Chantal to get the um, recorded version of this posted on YouTube. Electronic circuits instead of blood, yes. All righty. Yeah, the um, carbon Carbon dioxide actually is CO2 with double bonds. Um, silicon uh, dioxide doesn't have double bonds, has single bonds. There's a thermodynamic reason for that. Turns out that two silicon oxygen single bonds end up being lower in energy than a silicon oxygen double bond. So in fact, if you had SiO2 with the same structure as carbon dioxide, enough of it getting it getting together would simply crystallize. It would um, be a, a favorable reaction for it to turn into a solid. Probably no hordas, yes. I was thinking that there would be a great Dr. Seuss book by, the, by now, the, the Horda Hears a Who. Magnetic resonance. Um, Magnetic resonance shouldn't affect bonding because um, it's a um, it's a fairly low energy process. Uh, it uses radio waves to flip nuclear spins. Um, so uh, to affect bonding, you tend to need um, higher energy radiation like visible light or UV light. So now, of course, if you put too much energy, you know, a microwave is um, excites the rotational energy states of water molecules. So it just makes them spin faster. But, you know, if whatever energy mechanism you use to input energy into a system, if you thermally make the system like very, very hot, well, of course, that might affect bonding through um, secondary reactions.
Alrighty. Well, I just remembered I'm still recording, so I'm going to um, get a view of the audience. I love this venue. Having a giant molecular orbital diagram in the sky is, um, well, for me it's a dream, but for most people I think that would be a nightmare. Um, yes, I'd like to work with you to get a, um, to, to put some of these exhibits on um, the Science Circle land. That'd be great. Cool. Excellent. Well, what I'll do, um, I don't think we've got any uh, presentations coming up in the next couple of days. I'll leave the um, 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 objects where they are for about 24 hours or so. And uh, then, Chantal, we can um, um, work to figure out where these things can, can go. <laughs> All right. Well, well. Thank you all. Um, I've had a I've had a great time, um, and I'm certainly very open to um, you know giving a few other talks on um, um, chemistry type subjects uh, when 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 desired. Excellent. I will. Um, I will say hello to the cats. One of them has just woken up behind me. I don't think it made it uh, into second life, but he was snoring quite loud. All right, very good. Well, th well, thank you all. So, um, what uh, what I have to do now, I think, is um, some some uh, oh yard work. There are there there is a lawn to be mowed um, before we get more rain. And uh, you're all you're all welcome. I have enjoyed um, the various talks that I've seen over the. Um, you know, the last year or so, um, you know, while I can't take you to um, Pluto, um, you know, um, I can take you to the nanoscale. Oops. Alrighty, so I'm going to stop the recording now.